pretty when you are. Right, um, if I could uh, welcome you to the Foreign Correspondents Club of Thailand for our regular Wednesday night program. Um, as usual, I'll just give you a rundown on what's coming up. And it's actually the most amazing end to the month that I've seen in a very long time. Uh, on Thursday, that's tomorrow, uh, we're going to be taking a look at how we stop Asia's great river deltas from sinking and shrinking. Um, and this is... Um, something that's a huge problem. Vietnam and Bangladesh are two of the most affected delta areas in the world, and the whole inundation question and how it's going to displace population uh, and the, the implications for um, sec regional security are just enormous. So we have Stuart Orr of the Worldwide, Worldwide Fund for Global Freshwater, uh, Peter Jackson, uh, director at Lockton Watanar, Dr. Sari Suptaratit, who's the Senior Director of Climate Change and Disaster at Rangsit University, and more people to be announced. And then on Friday, um, from the disastrous to the delicious, we're doing a program on edible bugs and the protein of the future. Um, and this is going to cost you a bit more than usual because you're going to actually get to eat bugs and watch uh, the panellists eat bugs. And we've had great difficulty finding a moderator who would take on the programme and eat the bugs, and it won't be me. Um, so, yeah, I'm a coward. Um, so that's something to really rock up for. Uh, what have we got? Rochetta with malt crickets and silkworms, silkworm fried rice, ant egg jelly, chocolate brownies baked with white crickets. I mean, you can't miss this. Um, then on Monday we have a documentary, Blue the Film, and this is being done in conjunction with the Australian Embassy, um, and it's telling a story about the changes that are occurring in our oceans, marine life, and the likely impact on humankind. Of course, the Great Barrier Reef is one of the great disasters of the world. Um, then on the 22nd, of October, which is a Tuesday, we're having a non-FCCT program, but it's about the uh, opening of the Zayaburi Dam in Laos, uh, which is one of many dams slated along the Mekong, which uh, also have huge uh, implications for regional security and well-being, uh, including um, the future of the Mekong Delta, Vietnam, and the Tonle Sap. Uh, which are threatened by these massive curtain dams that are going in a, a, along the um, Mekong, most of which are built with Chinese money. And uh, we will have uh, Dr. Carl Middleton for the Centre of Social Studies, Development Studies at Chulalongkorn here, Professor Le Antoine, who's Research Institute of Climate Change at Kanto University, Maureen Harris, International Rivers. Uh, an excellent panel. Then... On uh, Friday the 25th, we're going to have an evening with Charles Dickens and Mark Twain. Um, and that will be um, put on by the Performance Exchange Theatre. So that's a, some, some pure entertainment. Um, and I think I'm going to ease off there. We've got some more documentaries already slated. But as I say, it's an amazing end to the month. And I don't think there are many clubs in Bangkok that can offer that kind of variety. Um, and so to this evening, tectonic politics. By Nigel Gould Davis. Um, it's got this um, amazing cover, which I think you need to be quite careful of if you've had a drink or two. But uh, I was told it was like a James Bond novel. It's a, well, Austin Powers, I'd say. But uh, Austin Powers. Yeah. 
Anyway, in Asia and throughout the world, political risks are rising rapidly. They now impact more markets, countries and companies than ever before. Even the biggest companies and countries make costly mistakes in dealing with them, but traditional methods of dealing with them are losing legitimacy and effectiveness. In this new book, Tectonic Politics, Nigel Gould Davis provides corporate leaders, scholars and engaged citizens with a groundbreaking study of the fastest rising risks today. In his talk, he will explain the complex shifting landscape of political risk and share insights about how to navigate it. The book is based on his extensive uh, experience as a diplomat, energy analyst and academic, um, and he's spent the past um, three years working on it. Uh, sorry, I've just lost something. Um, Nigel has a very unusual background um, and he arrived in Bangkok by way of uh, British Gas where he'd been working for three years uh, advising them on their activities in Central Asia and from there they sent him on to Southeast Asia uh, where he was based in Thailand um, and after a while decided that he wanted to return to um, academic life. But his, his background is more interesting because he's a former British um, diplomat uh, and an associate of the Institute of in International Relations. Uh, and from 2000 to 2010, he served in the British Foreign Office, including as the ambassador to Belarus. Um, and then he went on from 2010 to 2014 um, to work with BG. Um, and he's also on the board of the Foreign Correspondents Club of Thailand, so we're very honoured to have him. Um, so, Nigel? Thank you. Your thank book. you very much, and thank you all for, for showing up. Uh, it's very nice to see uh, what's now a pretty full house, in fact. Um, there's a, a famous saying that, uh, that power corrupts and PowerPoint corrupts absolutely. Um, I've just, just, just a few slides here. Uh, and I'd like to spend a few minutes uh, sharing some thoughts and, I hope, insights from the book that, uh, that Dominic has mentioned. Uh, tectonic politics. Uh, when the book first came out, Amazon told me that it uh, had now reached the, the, the top 20 books about volcanoes and earthquakes. Uh, but in fact, it's about political risk. Uh, political risk uh, we can define as... Uh, the ways that collective power, political or social power, impact and in particular hinder market production and exchange. I'll say a little bit more about that definition and offer what I hope is a helpful way to think about it uh, in a moment. Uh, why did I write the book? It was a consequence of sustained reflection about the various phases of my own career that Dominic outlined, in particular the transition from the diplomatic world, where engaging with difficult, complex human institutions is the business, is the essence of what diplomacy is, to the private sector, where companies realize they need people to do that sort of thing, but where it's just a means to an end, because private market activity is ultimately all about making uh, profits. It's about the bottom line. So how does uh, the craft of engagement, of dealing with governments and civil societies and so on, how can that mesh into the work of value creation? And what I discovered, not only in my own case, but talking to lots and lots of other people like me in the private sector, is that there was a, there was a paradox at work. On the one hand, companies more and more appreciate there are these things called political risks out there, which create problems have to be anticipated, monitored, managed, and engaged. And they hired people like me to do that for them. On the other hand, this work never really felt properly integrated into the corporate bloodstream and mindset. It tended to stand at some kind of uneasy distance or relationship between the real, the tr traditional core market activities of producing things and monetizing them. Uh, and I wanted to understand why this was and offer a view about, give a, a shape to the subject, the stuff of political risk and offer some ideas about how companies can uh, do it better. So 
Political risk is all around us, and there's more and more of it all the time. Here are some headlines taken literally from uh, the, head, the newspapers of the last few days. Just a, a few select examples. I could have chosen uh, many more. Uh, who worried about political risks, say, 40 years ago? Very few people, really. Mostly a small number of large Western companies, usually involved in the always sensitive work of getting stuff out of Mother Earth, oil, gas, metals, minerals, in difficult, dangerous, dodgy parts of the world, distant from the West, where governments were either too strong and controlling and restrictive or too weak and unstable and, and prone to domestic violence. The political risk was not very salient. It didn't really matter very much. Who worries about political risk today? Lots of people, and for very good reason. It's not only Western companies, it's non-Western ones too, as they go out into the world from Asia in particular and encounter in the West when they're trading there and investing in Western societies, uh, encountering states and systems and civil societies very unfamiliar to them, very different from those that they know from their, uh, their home countries. Uh, political risk is not only anymore something that is generated by the so-called distant and difficult parts of the world. Political risks are now escalating in parts of the world hitherto considered politically stable and uh, tranquil. Exhibit A, Trump. Exhibit B, Brexit. And perhaps most intriguingly, political risk is no longer only something that is uh, a concern of extractive industries and the like. Uh, sectors, companies that have a big, heavy, long-term footprint that make large investments over many decades where there's a strong, tangible, physical presence. One of the most interesting and surprising developments in recent years is how important political risks have been to the digital industries. Weightless and light speed. These companies have a minimal footprint. They have a few server farms and a few offices, but otherwise they're intangible. So here's a question to consider. What is the biggest risk of any kind, of any kind at all, that, say, Google faces today or Facebook? And a plausible answer to that question is EU regulation and US regulation. The third headline there, the woes of Facebook's, uh, Facebook's proposed uh, e-currency, uh, Libra. That's literally from this morning's FT. It's a consequence of relentless and growing US government scrutiny. Not a different and difficult part of the world. This is the, uh, the Facebook's own home government, so to speak. So lots of interesting developments and escalations in the, the complex world of uh, political risk. And I would argue that today, political risks are the fastest rising category of risks of any kind, with the possible exception of cyber risks, which are wholly new and without precedent. The most rapidly rising risks. And again, for some companies, and those we might not assume, they are the biggest risk of all, Google, Facebook, and so on. So what is political risk? I'll just offer a way of thinking about the subject, which I think is analytically helpful. It's about power power, collective power, either in the form of sovereign governments or, I'll say a bit more about this in a moment, social power, the demands and expectations of civil societies, and the ways they seek to constrain and influence uh, private companies. It's the impact of these forms of, social, uh, of uh, sovereign social power on market activity, private market activity, production and exchange. Now, how does that work? What forms does it take? Political risks take four distinct forms. The first, the most perhaps obvious uh, and the most devastating, is the power to destroy. Sovereign states with their monopoly of force can, in wars or in civil wars, simply uh, destroy, destroy assets, uh, destroy trading relationships, destroy investments, and so on. The most brutal, obvious, and direct form of uh, 
political risk. Here's a heartbreaking example from Syria before and after the conflict. Or political risk as violence can take the form of challenges to sovereign power, in the form of terrorism or uh, opposition movements and civil wars and so on. So the power to destroy. Second, the power not to destroy but to seize, where a government sees a, uh, an investment, an attractive asset on its territory and says, we'd like that. Nationalization, Hugo Chavez and Exxon here is an example of a, a, a physical fixed asset being expropriated. Uh, the functional equivalent in the world of finance is sovereign default. It amounts to the same thing. Government borrows money, refuses or fails to pay it back. That's expropriation by any other name. So destruction and seizure, those are exceptional events. The third form is routine and pervasive, uh, and that is the power to regulate to, uh, of governments to say to companies working in their territory, yes, you may produce an exchange, but we're going to impose rules about how that happens. We're going to require that to be done to certain standards. Some forms of activity we're going to permit, some we're not. Uh, and also, we will extract, we will tax a proportion of the income or the profits that you uh, receive from your activity. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Proper responsible regulation, uh, looking after workers, consumer standards, health and safety standards, those are an essential and necessary part of uh, business activity. But they are a cost to business if business wouldn't otherwise voluntary, voluntarily have um, abided by these regulations. If they're imposed on businesses, they are a cost. And the same with taxes. And finally, governments can block, they can restrict, make more costly or prohibit flows across borders of trade, of investment, repatriation of profits, and so on. So those are the four forms that political risks take, the four ways that power restricts markets by destroying, by seizing, by regulating and taxing, or by uh, blocking. What's the story? What has happened to these forms of political risk in recent decades? Until recently, these forms have fallen. The amount of political risk in the world has declined. That's the, been the broad story of globalization. Um, but let's look at these trends, happy trends as they were, uh, more closely. So how would we assess the incidence of violence in the world and its capacity to destroy? One way of looking at that is to assess the ways that battle deaths have changed over time. And here's a nice graph that illustrates that. It's a bit bumpy, it's not a downward line, but the trend is clearly downward. If you look at the number of uh, violent deaths from battle since 1945, there are various peaks and humps and so on, but at that far right-hand end, much, much lower than previous decades. So until recently, the incidence of violence in the world had fallen significantly. And especially, this is important, in the most asset-rich parts of the world, most peaceful parts of the world have been the richest. Secondly, seizure, expropriations. So what's been the trend there? You see a slightly different graph there, a big upward hump there in the 1970s. That was the era of the nationalizations of the oil and gas uh, industries, uh, mining as well, Western companies in non-Western parts of the world. Remarkably, though, as quickly as that rose, it then fell. By the end of the 1970s, uh, the incidence of asset seizure had fallen away, and it's been pretty low ever since then. So the incidence of expropriation as a risk has fallen. Thirdly, regulating and extracting. A number of ways that one can try to assess the trends here. Here, I think, is quite a useful one. These are data provided by the Heritage Foundation, an American think tank. Now, some of you may know the Heritage Foundation. They are very, very pro-market. They're very, very keen on uh, private activity and generally hostile to government intervention. So they watch very closely for evidence of government restrictions on private economic freedom. This is their data. The higher the number, the better. So uh, their graph shows very clearly that the amount of economic freedom in the world has increased in recent decades. 
Until recently, until the last couple of years, there was a downward blip there, so a sign that uh, things may now be, be beginning to move in a different direction. But in previous decades, the, the upward trend, more freedom, less politics, has been clear. Surprisingly, if you look at the data in more detail, you see that the biggest increases in economic freedom have taken place, again, in the richest parts of the world, especially the EU. It runs quite contrary to the assumptions about a constraining EU superstate, which is such a part of the, the Brexit uh, rhetoric in my own country. The data say no. In fact, the completion of the EU single market project has been a project of significant uh, market liberalization. And finally, the power to block. How has blocking worked in recent decades? Uh, and again, what we see here, until recently, is a steady growth in economic freedom, in this, in this time across borders. Restrictions and costs of doing international activity declining. This graph shows not only the increase in uh, international trade, but trade as a percentage of global GDP of global uh, income. You see from that that trade has become relatively more significant over time. Not just increase in absolute terms, but its relative significance to global activity has increased. So far, so good. But again, as this graph here shows, there's something awry and has been awry since the aftermath of the global financial crisis uh, in 2007-2008. The trade has not really recovered. Global investments across borders have certainly not recovered either. And what we are beginning to see now is a very significant resurgence of a wide range of political risks, uh, reversing, <laughs> reversing the decades-long trend of their decline. The, the happy earlier story of more markets less politics is really the story of globalization. Uh, we were taught that the earth was becoming flat, as Tom Friedman said, the sea was becoming calm, a lot of swimmers jumped in, a lot of economic ac actors took the view that political risks falling, it was safer now and easier and less costly to commit to international trade, to uh, foreign investment, to establishing complex global supply chains. And now the seas are becoming choppy again and a lot of swimmers are caught out there. Having committed themselves to an extensive degree of globalization, they're now finding rising costs, rising turbulence, rising challenge. That is the new uh, narrative of our time. And what is driving these rising risks? The key to this story is really three ways in which power and interests are shifting now in the international political economy. The first shift is between states. We all know what this story looks like. It's the relative decline of the West and the rapid rise of the non-West and in particular of China. This has fueled worries and concerns. You might have heard of the so-called Thucydides trap that in the worst case, we might see an outbreak of conflict between the, uh, the, the two new major powers, the United States and the rising challenger, China. Even short of that, even short of the prospects of direct military conflict, we have now what uh, even last week the UN Secretary General Antonio Guterres called a great fracturing, a great fracturing, uh, an adversarial uh, confrontation between alternative forms of regulation, alternative standards, a separation of a hitherto single global uh, economy and forms of regulation into something that's much more block-like, as antithetical to security, antithetical to the happy narrative of more globalization, less politics. The second trend is the redistribution of power and interests within states. 
and in particular within the richest states. So uh, the key driver of this is the rise in inequality in the wealthiest Western states, the growing disillusionment that this has uh, created in a growing number of, uh, of uh, proportion of the population in some of the richest states, a revolt against globalization. Again, Brexit and Trump. Now, this is new and striking. Even as recently as 15 or 20 years ago, the main resistors of globalization came from poorer countries. That was especially true in the late 1980s and in the wake of the East Asian financial crisis. For the first time since the Second World War, the major critics of globalization now are to be found in the most important economies. And when political circumstances allow, they have begun to capture the policy process, at least in some countries, particularly Britain and particularly the United States. So that is, that is quite new. And note again the concentration of this risk. It's not only that the risk of deglobalization is rising, it is shifting to some of the most important economies in the world. And that magnifies the global impact of this uh, revolt. In 16 of the last 23 countries, inequality has risen in the past 10 or 15 years. Some countries are handling that better than others, uh, continental Europe generally better than the Anglo-American world, so institutions make a difference, political leaders make a difference, but the underlying forces driving this critique, this developed world critique of globalization are strong. The third and final, in some ways most intriguing uh, development driver of rising political risk is the shifting balance between civil society and its values on the one hand and corporate activity on the other. In recent decades, popular trust and confidence in uh, companies and what they say and what they do has fallen very significantly. It's been replaced by a critique, by a, an ever-growing critical scrutiny of every aspect of uh, corporate activity motivated by ethical concerns. This is a very, very interesting development. One of the fundamental questions in the social sciences is what happens to social values, what happens to the views of societies as a country gets richer? And there are lots of ways of sort of exploring that. Uh, the most significant body of work, I believe, is, uh, is a, a decades-long study developed by uh, Ronald Inglehart and his colleagues at the University of Michigan. So they, since the late 1970s, have been going around the world every five years or so asking people a whole range of questions about their views and their values and their beliefs about everything. And what they find, found time and time again is that as countries become rich, as they reach a high income status, their values shift. They become a they circle of empathy that they feel towards strangers widens they become more and more concerned about the welfare, not only of themselves, but of people they will never meet, people sometimes thousands of miles away. They worry about the welfare, the interests, the autonomy, the dignity of others. And this has manifested itself in Western developed civil society attitudes towards their own company behavior in other parts of the world increasingly holding their own company to account for the activities of those companies in other parts of the world. And here are a number of examples here. So the first on the top left there, uh, Nike. This is a, a famous sort of breakthrough case. In the 1990s, it was discovered that Nike were selling expensive trainers, of course, in the West, and treating the labor that made these trainers thousands of miles away, uh, in, or sometimes in this part of the world, uh, in less than ideal conditions. That creates a consumer revolt. Uh, boycotts, demonstrations, uh, widespread criticism of Nike. Again, this is Western civil society criticizing Nike for things it did in other parts of the world. And that caused Nike to 
review and revise and ultimately change its practices. Second example there, top right, Starbucks here, you know, product placement. Very, very interesting case. So 2014, uh, Reuters wrote a report. They'd researched it for six months. Produced a report saying, in the UK, Starbucks sell a lot of coffee, make a lot of money, pay virtually no tax. The UK government was perfectly happy with this arrangement. The UK government had no complaints. But when this report became known, it created a storm of indignation in parts of British civil society. Demonstrations, boycotts, pickets outside of Starbucks stores and so on. Starbucks initial response was, we're obeying the law, we're not doing anything illegal, we're paying the tax we're obliged to. That defense lasted about six weeks. And in the face of growing public criticism, Starbucks ultimately agreed to pay an additional voluntary tax contribution to the British Treasury. It's a very striking development. Which companies pay more tax than they have to? And this is not a poor country. Britain was the fifth richest economy in the world at the time. So there's something very interesting going on here. This is the autonomous and distinctive force of civil society able to impose demands for higher standards on corporate activity, quite separate from the legal power to regulate. It wasn't the state doing it, it's all society doing it. So how does it do that? Boycotts, consumer behavior, consumer action, ethically motivated, is one mechanism by which it does so. A second mechanism, disinvestment. We're seeing this in large quantities now. Uh, activist investors, particularly on the issue of climate change, the great issue of our time, saying we will disinvest from fossil fuel. Uh, uh, companies. And the third way that activist consumer societies seek to impose their ethical values on companies is in some cases by refusing to work for companies or protesting as employees uh, from within a company. Google has experienced that a couple of times in recent occasions. There's been ethical unease among parts of the Google workforce about some of the projects that Google has been working on. Google has been forced, for example, to suspend contracts on smart drones with the Pentagon. So this is civic regulation, not re legal regulation. And it's a pretty new thing. And its salience and its significance are rising. And companies realize they now have to understand and manage and, if possible, uh, anticipate this. Uh, the last two examples there, uh, so Facebook in India, they tried to roll out a kind of light touch, uh, free basics they called it, a version of Facebook uh, to India's rural poor. That ran up against civil society concern about the violation of net neutrality. Facebook, despite having invested expensively in its campaign there, was forced to retreat. They didn't get the politics right. And not with respect to the government, but again with respect to activists. And finally, really extraordinary example, we come full circle. This is Nike again. This is Colin Kaepernick, of course, the American uh, football player who has been uh, taking a lead in protesting the uh, inequitable treatment uh, of, uh, of African Americans. Uh, it's become, in some ways, a controversial figure in the United States. But here you have Nike making him their poster person. Quite extraordinary development. Part of a more recent extraordinary development we've seen in the past couple of years of American companies and the CEOs themselves taking public positions on controversial issues, be it gun control, transgender bathrooms, uh, immigration policy. Controversial issues like these were always matters from which companies traditionally shied away. We make money. We serve our consumers. We don't get involved in politics. But increasingly, the force of civic regulation, the ethical demands of civil society, mean that everything is becoming political. And it's becoming harder and harder to hide. It's a very, very striking development. So those are the three uh, trends that are driving the rise of political risk. The shift of wealth and power between states, the shift of wealth and uh, the distribution of income within states, especially within the wealthiest states, and the shift of trust, the shift of values between civil societies and uh, corporate activity. Three fundamental tectonic forces which are together creating an unprecedentedly complex 
political risk environment, driving political risks up rapidly, the fastest growing uh, risk of any kind. To make it more complicated still, the old traditional ways of managing political risk are becoming delegitimized. In the past, going right back to imperial times or even sort of early post-imperial times, if companies got into trouble, they either used force or they could get their, their states to use force on their behalf. That's pretty unthinkable now. Force is out as a way of protecting corporate interests. Money, too, in the form of bribery of various kinds, or let's not call it that, let's call it facilitation payments or something like that. The standards governing uh, corporate activity in that respect has risen very, very significantly. UK Bribery Act, Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. These have global significance now. Wherever American or British companies operate around the world, they are subject to the requirements of, this, of these acts. And there are other forms of legislation like it in other countries. So using force, using money, these are no longer solutions. They are delegitimized. They are less effective even as the scale and complexity of political risks themselves are escalating rapidly. So it's a very, very difficult time uh, for companies. Companies need to learn to engage directly with the range of political and social stakeholders that are creating these risks for them. So we may be entering what you might call the age of the engager. What's, what's the core of a traditional company's activity? It's two things. It's production and exchange. It's figuring out smart ways to make stuff, clever outputs from inputs through technology, through organization, through creativity. That's the work of engineers. Engineers in the general sense of, of people who make things, who, people who produce things. It can be a bridge, it can be a a new kind of coffee machine, it can be an algorithm, it can be a financial product. Production is at the heart of company activity. Equally, exchange, monetizes. Not enough to produce things, you have to persuade people to buy them. So we can think of the traditional company as a coalition of engineers and commercialists, people who produce and people who exchange. They are distinctive skill sets, and some of the most famous and successful companies have been coalitions between specialists in producing and specialists in monetizing. Here in the top left, James Watt and Matthew Bolton. They're responsible for the steam revolution in the early 19th century. You've probably all heard of James Watt and his steam engines. Matthew Bolton was the commercially minded partner who figured out ways to make money from that. In our own time, the two Steves, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak. Again, you've all heard of Steve Jobs. He was more the marketing guy. The engineering genius was Steve Wozniak. He was the one who really understood with anyone else the guts, the, the, the innards, how Apple uh, computers uh, could be made. Uh, each is good at their own thing. You need a coalition of the two working together. There are other examples as well. Uh, those are the two most famous. So that's the traditional heart of a company. Now, I argue that... In an age where everything is becoming more political, where the, where the scale and the complexity and the variety of political risks is escalating, you need a third role. You need the engager. So what is it the engager does that others don't? They specialize in dealing with difficult humans who, if not managed right, if they take against you, can create severe political risks for you. So engine, the traditional coalition of engineers and commercialists, producers and exchangers, needs to be supplemented by the role of the engager. And again, it's a different skill set, a different way of seeing and doing. And I've seen myself, and I have lots and lots of stories which I've harvested from conversations with others, many, many examples of what goes wrong when somebody with an engineering mindset or someone with a commercial mindset tries to do the complex stuff of politics. They just get it terribly wrong. Lots of examples. But here's a, here's a, here's a thought, broader thought for you. 
Look at American presidents. There have been two engineer presidents. The first was Herbert Hoover. Okay, not considered a successful president. Presided over the Great Depression. He, had a, he came from a thoroughly engineering background. The second was Jimmy Carter. Again, generally not considered a successful president. They did great work before and after their presidencies when they applied themselves to the technical tasks of that engineering skills require. Herbert Hoover led fantastic relief efforts at the end of the First World War. He probably saved more lives than any other single individual in history, actually, particularly his work in famine relief in the aftermath of the First World War. Jimmy Carter is responsible for eliminating guinea worm, this horrible, horrible disease. Uh, he applied the Carter Foundation uh, to it, and uh, that basically has, has been eliminated. Technical uh, engineering kinds of problems amenable to engineering solutions. That's the mindset that, that, um, that succeeds in those cases. Try to apply that to the messy stuff of politics where you're dealing with a variable, shifting, complex, emotional, tangled human landscape. You need different skills. You need different skills for that, a different way of seeing and doing. Now then, finally, some implications of all this for Asia. What does all this mean for Asia? The first point, three points here. The first is that um, political risks are here to stay. They're not going to go away. They're not accidental. They're not blips and bumps. There are deep forces driving uh, political risk. Now, we may not know exactly how they'll manifest themselves, but the just as we can't predict when an earthquake will take place, we can nonetheless identify the tectonic forces that are driving them. And politics always play a role. Again, institutions, accidents. Think back to Brexit and Trump. The tectonic forces of populism were there, but had 0.1% of the vote gone the other way in Michigan or Wisconsin, uh, then we wouldn't have had a President Trump. The Brexit vote 50, wasn't even 52%. It was 51.89% of the vote. Do two decimal places. That could have gone slightly differently. So tectonic forces are always refracted through detail and accident and chance and personality. Nonetheless, the deep story of the rise and rise of political risk and the forces driving it, that will continue. Uh, that matters for Asia because, as we know, Asia is getting rapidly wealthier and more significant in the world. Much of that rise has taken place astonishingly recently. So 1948, 1948, just after the Second World War, Asia comprised only 15, 1.5% of the global economy. As late as 1990, it was only 20%. Next year, it will probably be 50%. So that jump is rapid, and it will continue to rise. Now, most of that rise after 1990 has taken place in internationally benign conditions where the risks of major conflict have been low, certainly between America and China, and the risks of a deglobalization have been low as well. Now, both of those facts are changing. So the big question now for, for the world, but in particular for Asia, where there is so much rapid growth taking place, is how will these new political risks impact Asia? And how will Asian societies and Asian governments uh, respond to them? With growth, with rapid growth, come changes in political values, the social values. So how will that roiling process of continued modernization as part of the world play itself out. We know that this historic shift from tradition to modernity creates new interests, new forces, and new values that clash with the old ones, that clash with the status quo. The happy story, the Washington Consensus story, the Earth is Flat story 20 years ago said more growth leads to more democratization. 
inevitably. That seemed to be the case. What we've seen in the last three or four years in Asia, and some other parts of the world, particularly in Asia, we've seen a reversion to more authoritarian kinds of politics here. Is that a stable accommodation? I very much doubt it. So we have younger generations, more educated, less tolerant and patient of traditions and conservatism and authority, bumping up against more authoritarian governments now in many, many countries. We perhaps see that in Thailand, the Philippines, other places as well. So how will that play itself out? Sources of turbulence and uncertainty. There. And finally, I think it's a very, very interesting question. I'd love your views on, on this, of all these things, but on this in particular. The rise of civil society's economic activism that I described earlier, the rise of civic activism, uh, civic uh, regulation, imposing higher ethical standards on companies. That until now has been mainly a Western story. Could we see more of that in non-Western countries? Could we, perhaps are we already, seeing examples of Asian consumers boycotting unethical products or disinvesting from un unethical uh, forms of economic activity. I don't know. It would be very, very interesting to see whether this trend that we've seen in the West will play itself out in Asia as Asian societies become wealthy. Is it just about consuming or is it about an ethically minded market activity as well? Uh, it would be very interesting your views on that. So that's it. There's just a few of the, the editorial reviews there of the book. That's just a, a, a taster, I hope, of some of the, uh, the ideas set out, set out in it. There's much more to say about uh, these issues in principle, how they affect Asia, how they affect Thailand in particular. I'd be very, very interested in your thoughts. Thank you. Good. Well, as usual, we have a microphone in the middle of the room for anybody who wants to ask a question. Do I see Peter Johnson racing towards it? Grandpapa can still run. Uh, thanks for your uh, overview. Uh, Nigel, you've been here for quite a, quite a while. I can't remember which street protest you came here on. I mean, there have been quite a few in the last 10 years. The first the yellow shirts, and then the red shirts, and then the Suteps gang. Uh, and at the same time, right now, we have street protests going on in Hong Kong. Uh, I wonder if you can comment a little bit on that phenomenon of uh, uh, democracy on the streets. Because in Thailand, I remember during the height of the street protests, at least during the red shirts, you had this, this, this kind of, uh, what, this, this, this uh, uh, anomaly that you had, on the one hand, chaos in Bangkok, and yet the economy was just steaming along, you know. Most of the exports are going from the eastern seaboard, and everything was sort of peachy keen and uh, uh, so the impact the economic impact of this so-called rising political risk was actually rather small and in Hong Kong now I don't I don't quite know what's going on in Hong Kong but on the one hand you have this every day you, you wake up and read the papers and oh more protests in Hong Kong and yet you know I don't know has it affected the property market there and the stock market I mean to what extent is political risk kind of exaggerated in these countries that, uh, 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 you know, you, you, you get this impression that everything's going down the drain, but actually the economy is kind of chugging along and doing okay, yeah? <coughs> yeah. yeah, so uh, uh, some very interesting questions there. One about what's happened politically, and, sec and the second question related to that, mm -hmm. What are the implications for economic interests, including presumably corporate interests from outside the country thinking of investing in or trading with, uh, with, with uh, Thailand? So, so color points there. Yes, it's been, there have been periods clearly of upheaval in the sense of change of regime and usually some degree, at least in Bangkok, of 
activism in the street that has preceded or helped to precipitate that. Uh, I'd say in the longer scheme of things that Thailand has, I think, a remarkable record which is generally underappreciated. Uh, as a sort of political scientist, well, I'm not supposed to say that a country is unique in some way. It's just it's always a matter of comparisons and more and less and variables. You, consider, you, you see which countries are similar to or different from others. But in some respects, Thailand is, is genuinely unique. If you look, say so two things. If you look at economic developments in, say, the early 1960s, Thailand has grown more than almost any other country. There are a few exceptions. Um, China is one, South Korea is another, there are a few more. But it's right up there. If you, if you take the 1960s, a base year, you look at how much wealthier countries around the world are. There are, a few, there are a few countries that match Thailand's. On the other hand, if you compare Thailand to other countries in respect of political violence, you find that overall those levels have been remarkably low. Remarkably low, particularly in this region. Yes, we have episodes, outbreaks of the kind that, that Peter described. We have 1976 as well. We have uh, 2010 and so on. Uh, moments, flashpoints of particular violence. If you take the longer picture, though, you compare that to what happened in Burma after 1962, uh, or even the Malaya emergency, let alone Vietnam, let alone China, uh, let alone Cambodia, for goodness sake. Uh, remarkably low levels of violence. So Thailand's pulled off a remarkable, I think sometimes underappreciated trick of having gone through substantially this process of again, roiling modernization, which always creates new forces and new interests, always leads to clashes, never happened smoothly. It didn't in Europe in the 19th century either, uh, with less attendant mass political violence than elsewhere. That might be controversial to some, but I've looked into the data, and I think it's very, very interesting. Uh, to the point specifically about whether recent episodes have been a political risk, I agree that's more, much more contentious. And, for example, uh, if you look at the economic impact of the flooding in 2011, that was in many respects more serious than, say, what had happened the previous year in central Bangkok or what happened in 2014 and so on. So I wouldn't want to suggest that any form of political change of regime is necessarily a major political risk. I say, Thailand has... In Teflon character, it has more constitutions than any other in the world. Measured in that respect, it's very politically unstable, but in other respects, in respects of sustained mass violence, it's been very stable, in fact, especially in comparative context. Mm. Nigel, could I ask, what would be your advice to uh, a country like Thailand, a smaller country, and I think smaller countries, we also have to look at countries like Australia, New Zealand, Canada, mm. you know, countries that are Finland, for example, which are neighbors of big countries, and how should they behave? You know, I've been here over 50 years, and when I first came here, Thailand was very much the lackey of the United States, and, and so was the Republic of South Vietnam. Um, South Vietnam was treacherously abandoned by the United States. I mean, some of my old friends, like our late friend Barry Peterson, for example, raised a force of Montagnard um, at the behest of the United States uh, to serve their interests, and then they were abandoned. The same thing happened with the Lon Nol regime in Cambodia. The same thing happened and still exists in, in Laos with the uh, Hmong people who were the lackeys of the United States. So it's not true that, that Trump has abandoned the, uh, the Kurdish people. America is a treacherous nation, and that's its philosophy. It's not the only one, though. I mean, Russia abandoned East Germany. They abandoned Cuba. You know, these co big countries do abandon smaller countries at their will, at their, at their whim. So what should smaller countries do? Uh, today, Thailand is, I don't think, going to fall into the hands of the Chinese, although perhaps the Chinese are more 
faithful and reliable than the United States, but how, how should countries behave um, if they are smaller and if they don't have the same degree of power and strength as the big countries? Because the big countries simply do, are not faithful countries. They're not reliable countries. They're treacherous countries in, in a general behavior. So, so what should smaller countries do? I mean, some like Tito, for example, in Yugoslavia, or um, I guess Sukarno with his, you know, his smaller countries, his southern countries, they, they've tried to develop the idea of a third force, but it's very difficult to do. I don't know whether ASEAN as such could be a, a, a viable, uh, strong partner for, for Thailand, but you know, what should we do as smaller countries to look after ourselves at, in this time when so obviously the bigger countries are less and less reliable as, as allies? Yeah, very, very interesting question. We could have a whole little seminar on that sort of issue. But uh, yes, yeah, so British Foreign Secretary Lord Palmerston famously said that uh, he's talking about Britain, but he'd be talking about any major power by saying that uh, we don't have any uh, eternal allies or perpetual enemies who just have eternal interests. And who counts as an ally and who counts as enemy is organized around the shifting concept of where that interest lies. And uh, in the case of the Kurds, these past few days, we've had a, frankly, a heartbreaking uh, affirmation of that view and of the, 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 the point that you expressed about the, 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 the unfaithfulness of a, of a major power towards a former ally that had made sacrifices on behalf of that major power. So general advice would be in an uncertain world, if you're a small power, you can try to hedge your bets, avoid choosing, maintain good relations with as many countries, many major powers as you can. I think there's quite a lot of that going on in this part of the world now. No one, few, few countries are exceptions. I guess few countries now wish to side unequivocally either with or against China. Again, there are some exceptions. It's more a matter of maintaining cordial relations with both and keeping your heads down. An alternative approach is, is to bandwagon, to get as close as possible with the one, the, the major power that you ultimately think will prevail in any major power contest. Get close to them, show how unequivocally loyal you are, uh, and hope that they will continue to look favorably upon you. A special relationship, if you like, to borrow a term, of course, used most often in the context of the Anglo-American relationship, though even that is looking a little more problematic these days. So there's no final uh, answer to these uh, points, uh, but I you know, in, endorse and amplify the premise of your question, which is that um, uh, for small powers, it's always a perilous sea, and there are very few certainties. And international relations, my goodness, can change very, very quickly, very, very quickly. So always be looking ahead, looking around corners. I guess Singapore does this quite well, yes? They're smart, plenty of foresight. Don't be too enthralled to what appear to be iron certainties and fixed assumptions now. Always be aware of the contingency and uncertainty and plan ahead for the worst case. Thank you, Chris Bruton. Brian Mertz. I had an interesting talk in that it was uh, philosophical and you talked about the broad outlines of political risk. I wonder if you could go back a bit to your role in the corporate world and uh, tell us a little bit about how um, companies uh, deal with political risk. For example, uh, have you been involved in or observed how uh, risk analysts try to put even uh, you know quantitative uh, mm -hmm. ratings on risk, which I assume is what's done when financial services groups uh, are looking for information for hedge funds or for uh, you know trade finance. Uh, can you say anything about the uh, political risk consulting industry and professionals and how mm -hmm. they come to terms uh, quantitatively with 
uh, the kinds of risks that you've been talking about in very philosophical terms tonight. Thank you. Okay. I would say a problem with the current political risk industry is that it's weighted towards matters of prediction rather than attending to what I call the craft of engagement. There's a whole industry of predictions and forecasts all the time. Ian Bremer is the most prominent example of Eurasia Group, but uh, just one example. Every year, Eurasia Group brings out a list of predictions for the year and also a list of red herrings, things that they say people are worrying about but you shouldn't worry about. They said, don't worry about Trump. He can't possibly win the Republican nomination. And even if he does, he can't possibly beat Hillary. And then the next year, after he'd been elected, they said, don't worry, nothing to see in American politics. It's not going to become polarized or, or sort of uh, energized. There's far too much political apathy around. Uh, I mentioned both those examples in the book, uh, uh, and there are others as well. Um, political predictions are, in the sense, a fool's game we all have to play. And people do put quite sophisticated numbers on this. They try to boil down the, the ineffable stuff of politics into measurable comparisons, the good kind of political science discipline, as it were, or reflex. Uh, does it really work? No, I don't think so, actually. Um, political events are inherently chaotic in a sort of quite technical mathematical sense in which tiny perturbations, variations in initial conditions can create enormous consequences uh, in ways that no one can possibly foresee. So one way of thinking about this is uh, think about an eclipse, okay, an eclipse of the sun. Okay? We can predict thousands of years in advance when that eclipse is going to take place, to the very minute, because the orbits of the sun and planets and the moon and so on are fixed and very, very regular. Yes? We cannot predict what the weather on that day will be, and therefore whether we'll be able to see the eclipse or not, more than about three or four days in advance. Weather is chaotic. And even then we might not be right. Yes, weather is chaotic. Uh, and politics is much more like the weather than it is like astronomy. Uh, so yes, great effort is poured into this. And you turn on the television and it's CNN or whatever, and you have pundits, often the same familiar faces all the time, making their predictions. Most political predictions are wrong. And in fact, people have looked at this and they found that the more often a pundit is on television, the more likely they are to be wrong. <laughs> now, and why is this? It's not accident, it's not right, it's, it's actually a correlation. Why is this? Because the people who are invited on television are very entertaining. They give simple, bold, memorable, pithy, sound bite type uh, answers. Uh, slick and memorable and they sound good and they're polished uh, they're way too simple the people who really are more likely to understand a problem and more likely to give reasoned careful weighed and considered more accurate predictions make terrible television let's say on the one hand on the other hand on all of that and they will be careful and they will nuance and that sort of thing. So um, beware, beware prediction. We all have to do it. And I think, going back to the, the essence of your question, that there's too much production of what appears sometimes to be highly sophisticated, yes, and even quantitative uh, prediction. Not enough, this is one of the key points I make about how things could change, not enough thought given to how to do politics, how the craft, how do you talk to governments? How do you talk to civil society? How do you understand the cons complex shifting cons constellation of interests and mo emotions and relationships and moods and psychologies? This is, has to be sort of careful, constant work. And what you have, and really, and every time I give a talk like this, people come to me after and say, yes, I heard something like that happened and I saw this happen in my company, that sort of thing. An engineer CEO will go in, and I, I can't give you the names, unfortunately, it's confidential, but I, you know, I've been told time and time, some of the largest companies out there, global companies you've all heard of, 
will go to a CEO, oh, so will go to like a country, a, a national head, a head of state or government, and say, this is what I want. Okay? That's not how you do politics. You have to, part of the art of politics and the art of political engagement, not enough companies understand this, is to understand, as well as they do, where their interests lie and translate that into terms that are compatible with your interests. Or conversely, to turn what you want into terms, it's actual translation, into terms that are consistent with their interests. Not tell them where they're wrong. Yeah, okay, okay, another example, a German engineer talking to a, a government head saying, your policy is wrong for the following reasons. In a very, sorry, Germanic way. Very, yeah. Excellent engineered products, but very that, uh, applying that same mindset to the stuff of politics. How well does that go down locally? It doesn't. It doesn't. So that's where I think most corporate rethinking needs to, needs to be directed at now, bringing the engagement mentality and mindset. You might think of it as a kind of corporate diplomatic mindset into the culture, the DNA of the way the company breathes and thinks, recognizing that increasingly, especially in an ethically informed world, where every aspect of a company's operations is being scrutinized by a, a, uh, by a, a, um, a socially media, social media enabled and connected civil society, that everything is becoming political. You need to anticipate that. Peter Trina, a, a club member. I agree with most of what you've said tonight. I just wanted to ask you a general question about the social impact on political risk. That um, is there a direct link between how wealthy a country is and how much social impact they can have? A lot of the um, political demonstrations that, that we get now in, in wealthier countries are because people can afford to be liberal, can afford to have uh, wider attitudes. Poor people can't afford to be politically correct. Mm -hmm. When the, the whole thrust of, the, li of the, the life is just to survive, mm -hmm. if, you're working if your income is below the breadline, yeah. you're not interested in problems in other countries or in other parts of your own country. Yeah. You're just interested in surviving. So you don't care about the climate. Yeah. You don't care about pollution and anything. Yeah. You're just trying to get your one meal a day. Yeah. So is the, the uh, political pressure from the social side directly related to the wealth that's generated in particular countries? So as countries get Richard, they, they complain more. If we have a worldwide recession and depression, yeah. everybody will stop complaining because they can't, can't afford to. Yeah. 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 You're absolutely right. And this is one of the key findings and the key insights of the, the body of work that I just touched briefly on earlier. This is the University of Michigan. It's Ron Inglehart and Christian Veltzel and their colleagues. They've been, they've been going around the world every few years asking people their values, uh, a whole range of, sort of attitudinal questions. And comparing that with things like levels of income. And what they find in country after country is that as those countries get richer, their values change. And that makes very good sense. You can think of it, some of you may be familiar with Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Yes? If you've got nothing, your immediate need is survival. Yes? Shelter, food, safety. And then once your physical survival is ensured, you need social relationships, sense of belonging, sense of community, and then up and up and up. And th those in the most wealthy societies sort of achieved all of these, satisfied all these earlier needs, then it's about self-realization and meaning and including uh, this widening ethical circle of respect for others, including distant strangers we'll never meet. It's a characteristic feature of the wealthiest societies. The first taste we got of this was in America in the 1960s because in post-war America for the first time ever in history anywhere you had a country with a sizable portion of the population 
growing up without any worries about material needed and security. Those boom years, post-war years, late 40s and 50s and early 60s, rapid increase in affluence. A whole generation came of age never having to worry about these more basic needs. And they come of age in the mid-1960s, boom, what happens? Demands for racial equality, for sexual equality, gender equality, a war against, uh, protest against the war in Vietnam, and so on. Concern about others' uh, well-being, others who are not necessarily themselves. So and that's the first time you get these sorts of values beginning to be instilled in, an, in a sort of sizable amount in a, in a major country. But we've had much more of that since in the 1990s and beyond. So it's only then, only as wealthy countries, do you get these ethical values. Never before, with very few exceptions, the anti-slavery movement in the 19th century, you can sort of think in those terms. But yes, ethically informed consumer behavior, for example, or disinvestment and that sort of thing, is a characteristic and recent feature of the wealthiest societies. What I think we don't know yet is whether that's a pattern that will spread to non-Western wealthy societies, or whether, in fact, it's more culturally specific than that and something that only Western societies will, will, um, uh, will take as a priority. Yes? So what, are, what are the wealthy Asian societies? South Korea, Japan, you may know these societies better than I do. Do we see ethical activism in consumer behavior there? I'm not sure we do. Uh, well, they'd have the problem of poverty, I suppose. <laughs> Another way of putting it. Michael. Thank you. Um, I now have to dispute what you've just said by reference to contemporary debates, because one of the things that was obvious about or was reported broadly about Trump and Brexit was it was driven in part by those people whose living standards were going down. And that, that, you know, it was a howl of pain in America. It was also a protest against globalization in Britain. Do you think that this, and I'm big, I just want to know if you think that this will, these forces are going to spread maybe into the mainstream of, of, of the European project, as it's called. Mm -hmm. But also, you talked about inequalities, huge inequalities. I don't think anyone can dispute that. But that's very much happening in Asian societies. They're hugely unequal. I don't see ethical capitalism developing in these societies yet. How do you deal with that and what you've said? Or is that the next phase? OK, so firstly, yes, I, that's how I and others have interpreted the Brexit and Trump phenomena. They are, in substantial part, a revolt against globalization, not only economically, but also culturally as well, in fact. And there's a very, very strong age gradient here as well. So if you look at Trump voters in 2016, if you look at 18 to 29-year-olds, yes, the youngest voters, only 28% of them voted for Trump. If you look at 18 to 24 year olds in the Brexit vote, only 29% of them voted for Brexit. Okay? So it's about a younger generation being more open, being less afraid, actually, economically, but also culturally of globalization. So I fully share that part of your, your analysis. Will it spread to Europe? Now, this is very interesting. So one might think of it in these terms. So 2016 was the Anglo-American globalization crisis, the, the, the year of Brexit, the year of Trump. 2017 was the big test for continental Europe, French elections, the German elections. And there, yes, you had uh, higher support for the AFD in Germany and for Marine Le Pen in France, but they didn't really achieve a breakthrough. They certainly didn't win, yes? So, and why was that? So you have the same, again, tectonic force, but with different effects because the political institutions are different. Okay, and uh, there are some people here, I think, uh, who uh, some political scientists here or something, uh, um, will be familiar with arguments about the, the ways that political institutions are designed more or less inclusively. 
Yes? So proportional representation, for example, is a great way of bringing in disaffection early and making sure that voices that feel excluded and resentful become part of the politics. They're neutered, if you like. That often happens. Um, others are consociationalism is a technical term. Political democracies that are more consociational are more inclusive at an earlier stage. They don't allow an excluded, resentful, critical mass of the population to grow up, develop feeling it's ignored until they break through in a referendum or in this strange thing called an electoral college that you have in the United States. Yes. Um, so I think that's part of the reason, actually. Also, more generous welfare states, that sort of thing. So the politics matter. And that is, again, this takes us back to the problems of prediction. You can, you can understand, identify the tectonic forces driving change and driving rising political risk. It's almost impossible to predict exactly when and how they will express themselves in particular events. Because that's a consequence of institutions and leaders and accidents and, 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 and butterfly ballots, if you remember the 2000 election in America, and funny little things like that. Now, Asia, okay. Asia, Asian society is unequal, yes, uh, they are, particularly Thailand, of course. The difference, I think, is that in the case of Britain and America, what matters is not only the absolute level of, it, of inequality, but how well off people think they are now compared to 20 or 30 years earlier. If you look at the median income in the United States, it's hardly changed since the 1980s. Okay, so the average person, the average household has hardly got better off. Yes? That clearly is not the case in Asia. People are obviously much better off than their parents, let alone their grandparents. Okay? So you don't have that sense of grievance. I think that's the, the, the big, big difference. Right. Cues. Uh, James Wise, a member of the club and a former diplomat. Um, if there are any engineers in the audience tonight, you've upset them. Um, but I'll upset them even more because I think to partly illustrate your point, it's also true that some of our, the world's most notorious terrorists have been engineers. And it's the same mentality. They look at their religious texts mm -hmm. like a textbook. Mm -hmm. And it's either right or wrong. And, there's, and, and it's, it's, a, mm -hmm. a, it's a quite common mm -hmm. for really committed terrorists to have that scientific, narrow scientific, sort of often engineering mm -hmm. background. Mm -hmm. But that's not the, the question I have. It's just, to, uh, again, I think to part, illustrate from a different perspective some of the, mm -hmm. the, the points that you are making. Mm -hmm. You mentioned implications for Asia, the, what you call the harder international environment. I'm not disputing that, but I think for, it's probably a harder international environment, in fact, for Western companies than for Asian companies. Because as you showed, the shift of economic weight is moving to Asia. Asians generally, including Asian business people, understand how Western economies, Western society works, Western politics works because it's been the Washington consensus, not the Beijing consensus or the Tokyo consensus or the Bangkok consensus. Through Hollywood, through pop popular culture, all sorts of ways, people in this region understand the West much more, I think, than the West understands this part of the world. And I'd just in be interested in your comments because mm -hmm. my sense is that it's going to, looking to, to the future, it's going to be harder for Western companies mm -hmm to deal with this harder international environment than it might be for Asian companies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no thanks. First, in engineers, they're fantastic people. <laughs> and I don't, I, if any uh, engineers in the audience, no, please, um, let, me, let me dispel any Including the terrorists. that yeah. I hold any, anything less than respect for you. The wisest thing that I've heard Prince Philip ever say, you know, Prince Philip is infamous for saying things that are a little inappropriate, but he said something that was wonderful and memorable, actually. I even quote it. He said, think of this, he said, everything that wasn't made by God was made by engineers. He's absolutely right. And one of the revelations for me about working in the oil and gas industry for a few years 
was what incredible people they are, quiet heroes of our times. And they're not, you know, they're usually not big, flashy, egotistical types. They don't sort of make a big song and dance of what they do. They just get on with it. You know, maybe a little introverted or something, or, I don't know, blokey and beery or something. But they don't declaim their triumphs. They are doing unbelievable things all the time. They are finding better, cleverer, more ingenious, cheaper ways of doing really hard things that make all our lives better. I have huge admiration for engineers. They're phenomenal. They're the unsung heroes of our time, actually, I would say. So I hope that's <laughs> made that clear. Uh, on a very interesting point on, on the West and Asia and understanding or not. Um, does, I suppose the first, first point to make is in the matter of Asian businesses, Asian countries, companies, Asian companies going out into the world and encountering others. It's not only the West, of course. It's Africa, for example, Latin America. And I think there are cases we can see where Chinese companies have not properly understood Africa, for example. Um, do they understand America now? Does anyone understand America, actually? But if you look at the, the travails of Huawei and so on, um, maybe the West is becoming a harder place to understand, in fact. So such accumulated experience as there was for everyone is becoming less useful because the West... Wes is becoming strange to itself, let alone to anyone else. So that's that point. In addition, when Asians trade and invest across borders, they're not only, and in fact not even primarily, doing it beyond Asia. 60% of Asian trade and 60% of Asian foreign direct investment is within the region. So this is, as it were, Asians try having to understand each other. Now, do they or not? I, I, I find that a very interesting question. I don't know the answer to it. Is it just intrinsically easier for uh, you know, a Thai company to understand a Malaysian company or an Indonesian company, for example, or a Chinese company to understand a, uh, I don't know, a Philippine company or a Cambodian company than to understand a non-Asian environment? I don't know. I'd be very interested in views on that. Um, so, yeah, I take your point that I, maybe I would have been more inclined to be fully sympathetic to it until, again, the recent strangeness that set, set in in the West. Leah. Uh, my name is Leah Genovese. I'm a club member. Thank you, Nigel, for a very interesting summary of your book. I would like to take you back to one of your earlier slides on tax avoidance. You mentioned Starbucks. Mm. HMRC has been very, very, very generous <laughs> towards the likes of Starbucks mm. and the tech giants. Yeah. And it seems that France is the only country single-handedly trying to bring these American tech giants to book, yeah. pay their fair share, and disengage from in-your-face tax avoidance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Whether we like it or not, some of those practices are already in Southeast Asia. I'm going to be a bit economical with the truth, but a country in this region is engaging in tax avoidance, which is affecting companies in Thailand. Uh, the culprit is Singapore. So, in your study and analysis, can you give us some insights as to how tax avoidance, how quickly can it get to this region? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's. Uh, I, mean, I could have. Sh I do have a slide that included here of corporate tax rates in various parts of the world, and the absolute levels are different, but they're all downward over the past 20 years. This is tax competition. This is countries competing for mobile capital seeking to uh, attract it on the most uh, on the, the best terms possible and it's a very it's the many multinationals have made hay with this uh, the next it's, it's a severe problem there's growing recognition that it is there's no easy solution but the next big thing to watch on this is proposals of the OECD 
are just coming out with, have just been talking about for the last two or three weeks, a big base erosion uh, uh, project. Exactly, yeah, exactly. And they are ready now with some proposals. And I, just from the reporting on this, the sense I get is that there's a, there is a broad acknowledgement among o OECD members that they have to adopt something like this. It will be a fundamental, pretty fundamental shift in the norms governing international taxation. Uh, the details will matter very much. There'll be plenty of resistance uh, to it, of course. But that's really the thing to, uh, to focus on, I think, in terms of uh, ways to, to address this problem. Uh, it's, divide, it's divided even the EU. I mean, uh, Apple was fined by Margarita Vestaya in the EU for uh, its uh, tax arrangements in Ireland. So you have to pay Ireland this money. Ireland said, we don't want it. We're quite happy being a low tax base within the EU. Uh, so you get all these sort of complex conflicts of interest. Uh, but I think if anyone has the answers, it would be the OECD, actually. So I say, what, watch what happens to their proposals. That's true, that's true. But in the way these things work, the o if, if you get, and we've seen this in other cases as well, you get norms being adopted by one group of countries that sets standards and sets examples for others, gradually are widening. So I wouldn't expect this to happen uh, immediately, but once you have in place the wealthiest countries doing this, then they can export those norms. We've seen this in other areas of EU activity, for example. The EU is a nor global norm setter, very significant kind of soft regulatory power, maybe in this area too. It's not easy, and there are a lot of powerful corporate interests which will not be happy about this and seek to resist it. So watch, you know, that, yes, so it's not the work of a moment but big things never are. But we've got a, a start now, an emerging consensus, at least among the richest countries, about what the outlines of solution might look like. And that's something we haven't had before. I think very encouraging. Question? Yeah, good evening. Robert Kinnear, um, senior member here. I'm uh, actually an engineer, so thank you for all that praise you heaped upon us. Uh, we do have something in common. I actually was a senior drilling engineer for British Gas in huh? Islamabad in 1997. Uh, prior to that, I was actually a general manager of an oil company in Vietnam. Um, however, the, the point is more regarding the, the title of your book, Tectonic. Uh, of course, being an engineer <coughs> who has studied geology several times over in different capacities, uh, it generally means when, when plates move, mm -hmm. um, when one side of the plate moves, so does the other, and the plates that it encounters also has a, an impact upon them. <coughs> so <coughs> regarding the two points that were raised uh, just earlier on, regarding um, um, Brexit and what's going on in the Middle East, uh, and the current stuff that mm -hmm. um, Mr. Trump is uh, playing around with without really understanding the impact of the tectonic movement, um, what, do you, what gloomy prospects have you got for us regarding the schisms that are, creating, that are being created within Europe and the ripple effect, because it goes quite a long way through Europe to the Middle East, actually, uh, of course, mm -hmm. tectonic plates being large things, and uh, um, how is that going to affect things going on in South America, which we don't hear much about, but the whole thing's in a movement, mm -hmm. been mm -hmm. moving around there very strongly for the last mm -hmm. 20 years with large demonstrations in every capital city continuously that nobody reports upon over here anyway. So what's your view on tectonic movement and the foreseeable future? Right, so you, you, you subjected my metaphor to unusually searching analysis. Um, I called it tectonic for two reasons. One is the obvious sort of metaphorical purpose. It's all about deep and irresistible forces which cause sudden and significant and unpredictable eruptions. 
Uh, the second reason, more specifically, is that, um, well, I, in the course of this, I asked myself the question, who was the first person ever to use the term political risk? So trying to understand the nature of a, of a, of a, of a term or a, or a, or a problem. You, you trace back the origins of it. Who was the first person to use it? Turned out to be a 19th century volcanologist, Dazali. A chap forgotten to history, but mentioned in my book, um, called George Poulet Scrope, who was a, um, is a, one of these Victorian polymaths. He um, is a member of parliament. He was an economist as well. Uh, but his day job, actually, he was uh, a geologist. Specifically, he specialized in, in volcanoes. Did lots of path-breaking work on the uh, geology of the Auvergne in central France. And he was a friend of a friend of Darwin and so on. So all this stuff about the age of the earth and uh, its, its influence on evolutionary arguments and so on. He was part of that sort of circle. So it, again, it was a volcanologist really who, um, in, a, in a book on political economy, first used the term political risk, at least as far as I could tell. Um, back to these tectonic politics uh, and tectonic times, what, what the future is? Gosh. Um, Well, I think it's hard to even to make, as I was saying earlier, short-term predictions in politics. Making longer-term ones is essentially impossible. And actually, someone's done a study. They've looked at the, the major uh, worries of major powers. Like, at the beginning of the 1920s, what were the major powers worrying about? Beginning of the 1930s, what were they worrying about? Beginning of the 1970s, 1980s. And the things they're worrying about at the beginning of the decade were totally different from the things they were worrying about at the end of the decade, in most cases. It's, it's almost impossible to make any kind of short-term, uh, anything more than a short-term prediction with any degree of, of confidence. But watch, I mean, the, the big story of our time is the rise of China, right, and its consequences. And what will, what will change more? Will China change the world more, or will the world, as China engages with it, and as China itself becomes wealthier, will China itself change? Uh, ten years ago, even five years ago, there was a more confident view of these matters, especially in Washington, but in the West more generally. The view was, inevitably, as China grew rich, it would grow more liberal. That demands for greater accountability of power would grow inexorably within China. That narrative, that confident narrative, has taken a sharp setback now. And one of the biggest long-term consequences, I think, of the Trump presidency, something that will outlast all of the other things and turmoil we've seen the last three years or so, is how quickly the consensus among policymakers, bipartisan consensus on China has shifted. It's turned on a dime, really. And now there is this consensus view that China is now the major long-term challenger, even more serious than Russia. Russia isn't rising. Russia is, objectively speaking, and in the long term, it's declining. It's resurging, becoming more assertive, more aggressive as it declines. But all the indices of power for Russia are actually going the, the wrong way in the long term. It's China that's rising and rising. So the biggest sort of tectonic fracture in the world, I would say, one of the biggest ones, is that American-Chinese relationship. How will that develop? And I mentioned earlier the so-called Thucydides trap, this sort of view of looking at great power rivalries derived from you know, the work of Thucydides, the great Greek historian of the Peloponnesian Wars, who said what made war inevitable was the rise of Athenian power and the fear this caused in Sparta. So the uh, inevitable, it's a strong word. So the idea, the argument that one power rising against another power that inevitably produces confrontation. And Graham Allison at Harvard and others have written these works showing how throughout history such situations, rising power meeting a declining power, leads to conflict. Not in every case, and including not in the nuclear age. So the argument would be that in an age where two powers are so economically interdependent, financially and in trade terms and investment terms, as China and America are now, and where a condition of such clear mutual nuclear deterrence exists between them, 
there are rational constraints to prevent this rivalry between them assuming some really truly dangerous form. But we don't know. Disastrous accidents happen. There were people in 1914 saying Britain and Germany are too interdependent to go to war. That didn't stop them, unfortunately. So I'd say that's one of the great tectonic fractures of our kind, how deep it runs, how severely those plates will bump up against one another. Of course, we cannot know at this point. I found it very interesting, your comment, that um, a volcanologist invented the term political risk. Yes. And it seems to me that in this whole discussion, there's this chicken and egg element of what causes what, what leads to what. You know, mm. We live in a world of catastrophes, of uh, climate change, increasing volcanic activity, earthquakes, mm. the failure of antibiotics. You know, there's everything mm. you can imagine that mm. could trigger mm. political risk. But at the same time, something that we're seeing in this part of the world is um, the growth of outrageous behaviour. Um, klep kleptocracy, uh, Cambodia, um, impunity, uh, mm -hmm. Myanmar. They've just evicted 700,000 people and got away with it. Mm -hmm. um, I could go on. Um, the last Prime Minister of Malaysia was involved in a $4 billion scam. Um, mm -hmm. And then I just want to, on this idea of outrageous behaviour, I just want to pick you up on, on your interesting comments about Thailand's success and relative peace. If you go back to 1947, mm -hmm. the growth begins, and it's 7% per annum until the 1980s. Mm -hmm. And I think it was Pui Umpakorn who said, you can't fail in Thailand. You, you just grow the rice, you export it, the mm -hmm. market's growing, rubber, it, it will grow. It's no credit. But uh, Pui also pointed out that uh, every prime minister from 1947 to about 73 was a field marshal. So you could make the connection and say that military rule was a good idea, that it encouraged economic growth and stability. And yet, um, you know, the missing element is that in that is the technocrats, mm. the people that actually engineered the economy and got it going. Mm -hmm. So just to fast forward and bring it back to where we are now, um, we have military rule, mm. um, which by that simple explanation would be a recipe for economic success, minus the technocrats. Uh, it's changed. You, you cannot draw these, these simple lessons. But what I'm saying is, where is political risk? How, how do you detect it? And if you don't analyze all these very complicated little elements around it, you get it wrong. You know, um, pure political risk that's separate from all the other elements. This is a very, very tricky area. Anyway, what are your views on that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, a great rich sort of complex of questions there. Um, yes, one of the I suppose, dispiriting recent developments across much of Asia, that's particularly Southeast Asia, is the, as it were, the end of the end of history. Yes, so the confident assumption it had been made of China, made of other countries as well, that becoming richer will inevitably make countries freer. Uh, and we had some you know, famous examples going back sort of 30 or 40 years in the Philippines and South Korea and Taiwan and so on. Um, and yet in the last three or four years, maybe a little more, we've had authoritarian revivals in a number of countries. So what's gone wrong? People are still trying to understand this. I would say, I suppose, just be careful of over overdrawing implications or over-extrapolating the last few years of this adverse development is still very recent in sort of larger sort of political or social time. And again, what the political analysts do, what the Ian Bremers of this world do, is tend to they draw big conclusions from small um, numbers of, of, of particular events. If fast forward five or ten years, this may just look like a blip. We don't know yet. Malaysia is an interesting case. Yes, a, a stunning defeat for that kleptocrat in office, in fact. So even in this region, it's not a universally disparaging um, development. Uh, in terms of the, the, the underlying causes of Thailand's success, and I emphasize it's a combination of two things, not just economic growth, which, again, in comparative perspective, has been remarkable, but the fact that this economic growth has been accompanied by so little political violence outside of 
a small number of specific and, yes, terrible episodes. But in regional and comparative perspective, it's been very peaceful. Now, is this because ties are more peaceful? Well, actually, no. If you look at the data, if you look at the data on um, non-political violence, on homicides, for example, Thailand is higher than other countries in this region. Asia as a whole is a peaceful region. It's a country with low violent death rates. But within this region, Thailand is an outlier. It has one of the highest. So the paradox sharpens. Uh, relatively regional terms, higher uh, murder rate, non-political violence, but a low rate of political violence. It's even stranger. Is it military rule? Well, I, it's a, that's a hard one. Um, military rule elsewhere in the world has not generally led to high economic growth. You might be lucky and have a good general, but more likely you'll have a bad general who will be kleptocratic or corrupt or something like that. So what is, what is the, um, the answer to this puzzle? I don't know. I, I wonder, it's a genuine question, whether it's there's something about the unique form of legitimacy that Thailand cultivated over the decades, especially after the 1950s, a combination of modernization and re-traditionalization around a, a, a particular and special institution, and whether that pulled off the trick of bringing about rapid change that in other times and places has been dislocating, led to up upheaval, but keeping that contained, preventing that producing violent forms of mass sustained upheaval. I don't know. So something about the unique form of legitimacy that developed here under the previous reign, really. Maybe that's, maybe that's part of it. Yeah, and a lot of people got bumped off quietly. Well, 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 I'm not going to go into that. But. <laughs> well, again, look at the data in comparative perspective. I think, yeah, no, 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 where no. would you rather have been living since 1960? You look at, compare Thailand to all the countries around it. Well, Phnom Penh until about 69. Well, yeah. and then what happened? And then things got yes, bad. Then we but, yeah. Anyway, I think we've, uh, this is a very, very complicated subject. Uh, as a former ambassador to Belarus, um, Nigel is clearly an exponent of black art of diplomacy. And diplomacy, as somebody once said, is the art of letting somebody else have your way. Um, he's now an expert in tectonic shifts, uh, political shifts, and uh, clearly an expert. And I'm actually wondering whether this is your meal ticket. Has the Foreign and Commonwealth Office uh, rung up and asked you to come back? I mean, this is the right moment to hit the UK for a start. No comment. No comment. Anyway, Nigel, that was fascinating. Many thanks. And uh, bugs on Friday and uh, dams tomorrow. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.